All right, let's get started. So welcome everyone back to UCSF's Cardiology Grand Rounds. We are recording and streaming live to YouTube. I'm honored to be able to present today Dr. Jonathan Davis, who will be speaking to us on the recently updated heart failure guidelines. Dr. Davis was born and raised in San Francisco, and he completed both medical school and internal medicine residency at UCSF before moving to Washington University in St. Louis for fellowships in general cardiology and advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology. In this time, he also completed an MPHS degree focusing on clinical trial design, epidemiology, and biostatistics. After finishing his training, Dr. Davis joined faculty at Oregon Health and Science University, where he served as medical director for mechanical circulatory support. He was recruited in 2018 back to the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital to develop a heart failure program for the San Francisco Health Network, for which he currently serves as director. He was the recipient of the 2020 ZSFG Department of Medicine Henry F. Chip Chambers, MD, Medicine Subspecialist Consultant of the Year Award. His current research focuses on heart failure readmissions and systems of care delivery. Welcome, Dr. Davis, and thanks so much for giving this talk. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you. Uh, I'm incredibly honored to be able to speak with all of you today and get to, and talk about the guidelines. And uh, can I get a thumbs up, Layla? You can see the slides. Great. Wonderful. So the guidelines were, were formally updated uh, in April, when published online in April of this year and codified in May. And we're going to go through some of the key highlights. It's obviously a very lengthy document, but I want to hit on some, some general themes uh, that it covers, especially some of the changes and new highlights in the most recent iteration of the guidelines. And also finish up with some practical pointers on how we can actually implement some of these guidelines in our everyday practice. So there are a couple of big themes that stand out from, from the guideline statement. The first is the revamp classification of heart failure across the spectrum of ejection fraction. So thinking with more detail, and there's obviously been more publications, thinking about the different areas of heart failure from a reduced ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction, and an in-between area that we'll talk about this mildly reduced and a 40 to 50% range. Also, SGLT2 are formally codified in the guidelines. ACC did put out a position paper about a year and a half ago uh, that incorporated them, but now SGLD2 are not only in the guidelines, officially class one recommended uh, for reduced DF, but also have uh, indications that we'll talk about for mildly reduced and for reserved ejection fraction. So really, SGLD2 are, are on the map uh, big time in a big way for heart failure across the board. And also, I'm going to touch on this briefly. Uh, that they did codify some of the diagnostic and treatment strategies for cardiac amyloidosis. And for the very first time, they included sections dedicated specifically to disparities in vulnerable populations and uh, access to care. Um, the word disparities um, occurred just twice in the original 2013 guideline statement. Um, and so there's really been more of an emphasis uh, in these guidelines to bring attention to these other populations uh, and care delivery issues. So jumping in, it wouldn't be a heart failure talk without just doing a couple of key definitions. And this was updated and are really solidifying the diagnosis. Well, we know kind of no heart failure when you see it. However, the formal definition was updated in a universal guideline statement in Heart Failure uh, Society of America a year and a half ago, um, saying heart failure, signs or symptoms of heart failure by a structural or functional cardiac abnormality. So remember, heart failure is a syndrome, dyspnea, fluid retention. You have to have the syndrome of heart failure to have heart failure. You need to corroborate it with a BNP level or objective evidence of cardiopulmonary congestion or systemic congestion, edema, et cetera, but it's really a syndrome. It's not an ejection fraction by itself or an EF or a BNP by itself. You have to have the syndrome of heart failure. And the classification has been formally updated um, again in, in 2021 in the Heart Failure Society um, uh, nomenclature statement and again in the guidelines earlier this year. Think about ejection fraction um, as the key criteria for defining how we think about and classify heart failure. Systolic and diastolic heart failure, and we still unfortunately have to use that for billing sometimes. Medicare hasn't completely caught up with that as far as billing, especially on the inpatient service. Um, but formally, we're not using those, those terms to describe heart failure. As you know, everyone with systolic dysfunction has diastolic dysfunction. The opposite is also true. Um, we are talking about it formally with heart failure based on injection fraction. I still leave the words diastolic, systolic in my note just for billing. Um, that's not the way we're formally thinking about it, but we're thinking about it in terms of ejection fraction. And yes, there are obviously issues with the accuracy of ejection fraction, but it's what we've been using for 
40 plus years for clinical trials. And, and, and is this way you know, still what we're using uh, with reduced below 40%, the mildly reduced 41 to 49% and preserved greater than 50%. As we'll talk about with the updates with the guidelines, that it's really moving more and more into a dichotomous state uh, with heart failure below ejection fraction of 50% and above, that the overlap in the data supporting medical therapy for less than 50, whether it's less than 40 or in that 41 to 49, there's really so much overlap that we're really thinking of it um, as one entity. And hopefully some of you had the chance to hear uh, Luke Zier's grand rounds yesterday uh, in uh, uh, internal medicine. Uh, our new uh, inpatient uh, system at SF General um, to guide providers through heart failure management, which is really incredible. But we just dichotomize heart failure below, below 50 and above 50 for treatment. But please know that we're thinking about these three sections. And finally, what I think is really important to think about with the nomenclature, and it is a bit of alphabet soup, but really important how we think about heart failure with improved ejection fraction. So someone who starts off with a low EF, below 40%, and it comes up now greater than 10% into at least the 40s, if not higher. And we used to think about this as heart failure with recovered ejection fraction. And as you'll see with some other subtle nomenclature um, technical terms that have been updated with this uh, iteration of the guideline statement, that saying of heart failure um, that's recovered implies that it's, it's treated, that it's done. And as you all know, and I really want to stress that we're not curing the heart failure, even with medical therapy, even if they get revascularized or they have some other issue that's been resolved, that the heart failure is still there. And it's calling improved ejection fraction reinforces the importance of staying on medical therapy, even if things are getting better. And we'll talk about that more because that is codified in the guideline statement as well. Defining heart failure with these higher ejection fraction can be tricky, especially with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, given how prevalent the comorbidities are and how um, strongly the comorbidities drive a lot of the disease process. Um, but thinking about the ejection fraction cutoff, same criteria, obviously, for heart failure, have to have the syndrome of heart failure. But the gold standard for diagnosis is elevated filling pressures in the left ventricle um, in diastole. You have to have that. And that can be done in the cath lab. It can be done in the cath lab with exercise. Um, but really the, the elevated filling pressures are the hallmark, regardless of how the person wound up developing heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, because obviously there are multiple ways to get there, um, but you have to have elevated filling pressures. I'm not gonna dwell a whole long time on the stages. I do wanna point out that they did make some subtle changes into the, the nomenclature for the stages of heart failure, starting with stage A at risk for heart failure. And I think this is important because if you notice, it's anyone with hypertension, chronic kidney disease, obesity, et cetera, that this is almost every patient that we see in primary care clinic, let alone general cardiology clinic and beyond. But really the importance of addressing the comorbidities way up front, way upstream before they have the chance to lead to heart failure. Hypertension, for example, is the biggest modifiable risk factor for the development of, of heart failure and being extra cognitive of this as early as possible before the heart failure can actually develop. Stage B, pre-heart failure. Uh, this can be tricky for folks if we think about who are coming in and have something happen. They get an echocardiogram for a non-cardiac reason. They come into the hospital sick or they're getting an evaluation. It turns out they have some structural functional issue with their heart, but stage B is never having had heart failure. And more and more, this is being treated as stage C, even though obviously the clinical trial enrollment is a little bit less because if they don't have symptoms, they're not going to present for enrollment for a clinical trial. Stage C, we're going to talk about on the next slide because the guidelines really parse out different types of stage C. Stage C is 95 plus percent of the heart failure that you're going to see in the hospital or in clinic. And this is folks who have current or previous symptoms of heart failure. So even if you have heart failure just for a couple of days, one admission, you are going to be stage C um, and moving forward. And then stage D, obviously um, folks that are, are getting much worse, a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but very briefly, patients who are uh, getting worse, blood pressure falling, backing off on medical therapy, hospitalizations, defibrillator shocks, et cetera, thinking about whether they need to be referred to the Advanced Heart Failure Clinic and Dr. Klein and the team uh, for further evaluation. And again, just lastly, thinking about the, the nomenclature impact from this new statement. And stage C is, again, 95% of the heart failure that we're going to see, but it's not all created equal. Um, so there's obviously new onset, de novo heart failure, people coming with a brand new diagnosis. And then these two categories in the middle, we see a lot that there's folks who have resolution of their symptoms. So they get put on medical therapy, revascularized, et cetera, and they feel better. Now their EF may stay low, but they feel better. Their EF may improve back up to the normal range and feel better. 
by thinking about putting it in to remission, heart failure in remission. Again, just like we're calling it improved ejection fracture, we're putting the heart failure to remission. We're not curing the disease. It is still there. And we need to, again, emphasizing the importance of maintaining medical therapy. Finally, persistent heart failure, people that have been on medical therapy or had other intervention, they still have signs or symptoms and they're not doing better. Then finally, worsening heart failure, that they're not quite at stage D yet, but things are not getting better. And I think this is important in these four categories to think about kind of where in stage C, again, can stage C is so um, all encompassing for the majority of our patients, where they're fitting so we can tailor treatments and tailor education. A little bit of background on heart failure. I loved showing this slide just to put it into context, the survival and the prognosis that uh, it's very easy uh, to think that, well, gosh, your EF is 20%, you're in deep trouble, your EF is 60%, you're okay, even if you have heart failure. But I wanna stress is the, that it's actually not true. And there are many, many papers in, that, I, that I have a, other slides that show the same thing, but these are two of my favorite figures showing this, that you're, you have poor survival regardless of your ejection fraction. And it really highlights the importance of getting to patients early, being aggressive with any intervention we can offer to try to keep them doing as well as possible for as long as possible. On the left is about is a paper from several years ago out of South Korea, following patients prospectively with echocardiogram data for five years. And you can see probability of death on the y-axis. And on the x, you can see EF from 10% up to 70%. And it's pretty much a straight line that the probability of passing away independent of your ejection fraction was true over the course of the study. And finally, on the right is uh, Framingham data from 2005, 2014, uh, out of uh, uh, Jack cardiovascular imaging, the salmon color half ref, the green color half pef, showing median survival, it's about the same. Uh, mildly reduced uh, is interesting because it really depends on how the person got there. Did they go from half ref up to mildly reduced or they go from half pef uh, ejection fraction range down to mildly reduced? And it turns out patients that have gone from, have their ejection fraction decline, have a worse prognosis than patients whose EF has come up to mildly reduced or EF is consistently mildly reduced. And contextualizing the risk. ASCVD risk score is something that we think about all the time in, in cardiology clinic and in internal medicine clinic and thinking about patients' risk and whether or not they should uh, have an intervention or, or, or a statin, et cetera. And thinking about, oh my gosh, they're very high risk. They have a seven some odd percent risk of the high risk category of having an event in one year. But if you put a heart failure patient next to that, you can see this the significantly elevated risk heart failure patients um, live at every single day. And that they're the low risk, quote unquote, heart failure patient is still significantly higher risk than your high risk ASCVD categorization. Thinking about cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization in one year, that your quote unquote stable patient on medical therapy, NYJ class two, doing well, still has a significantly elevated risk of coming to the hospital or passing away that year. Um, and so being extra mindful as we think about the guideline statement and what we can do to make people do better. So going into the guidelines, specifically going into, we're gonna do the three ejection fraction categories. We'll start with reduced ejection fraction. So these are the class one recommendations, which hopefully are very familiar to all of you. The first three, and we'll circle back to them in the second, is that Arnie is first. Uh, that, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But evidence-based beta blocker, carvedilol, metoprolol, succinate, bisoprolol, any of them, they're equivalent. Whichever one you can get for the patient is most well targeted is what you want to use. MRA and now here, um, uh, class one recommendation, SGLT2, uh, based on the DAPA-HF and emperor reduced clinical trials. Now, both empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, um, uh, Jardians and Farsiga, respectively, are both approved. We'll talk about the dosing of those a little bit at the end of the talk. Um, either one, we can talk about some of the subtle differences between their two HEFREF clinical trials, but the take home is either one, either one. But for ARNI, want to drive home that ARNI is first line. We do not need to pre-treat someone with ACE or ARB first. We do not need to try them on that to see how they do. We do not need to wait for a BNP cutoff as initially um, after Paradigm, the first iteration of 2016 and 2017 updates to the guideline statement that um, you had to have ACE or ARB, and if they're still symptomatic, not anymore, that it turns out with the analysis of the various clinical trials and the guidelines say that we should only be considering ACE or ARB in patients with contraindications, intolerance, or inaccessibility to ARNI. So this is first line. They're coming to the hospital, they've never been on anything, ARNI first. If they see you and they've been on ACE inhibitor for five years, you should still switch them over. That the long-term benefits of switching over to ARNI um, are many, 
and that people should be on Arnie whenever possible. Again, unless there's a contraindication, intolerance, and accessibility, whether it's a BID medication versus daily or a cost. And yes, and I do want to drive home that it is a lot of medicines, but they really, really work. How much do they work? They work a lot. That the quad therapy, and I have a couple of slides just to, just to show the magnitude of benefit that putting people on these class one recommended medications, these four medication drug therapy of angiotensin receptor nebulizin inhibitor, I went to the sucubitral valsartan, beta blockers mentioned the carvedilol, metoprolol succinate, or bisoprolol, MRA, either spironolactone or plerinone, and SGLT2, um, empagliflozin or depagliflozin. And compared to historic ACE, ARB, and beta blocker use, because MRA unfortunately is, excuse me, uh, very seldomly used in clinical practice, that putting patients on this quad therapy regimen compared to a traditional regimen leads to a 62% relative reduction in cardiovascular death or hospitalization risk, 50% reduction in cardiovascular death risk, and 40% relative reduction on cause mortality. And visualized another way, putting patients on these the comprehensive quad therapy for your average 55-year-old, starting these four drug therapies can give them well over six years of extra added life on average. And thinking about your average 65-year-old can add over four years, almost four and a half years of extra life by putting them on this medical therapy. And I get asked all the time, well, my patients and other providers, like, God, it's a lot of medication. That's four drugs. Oh my goodness, that's so much. But that's part of our job as cardiologists and other providers is to help not only educate the patient on the importance of it, but to work with our team, to work with pharmacy, work with primary care, work with another cardiologist, work with whoever we can work with to partner together to say, yes, these meds are important and we got to get them for you. The example I like to say is if someone has cancer and needs our chop, you're not going to put them on R, you're not going to put them on hop, you're going to put them on R chop because that's what works. And this four drug medical therapy really works. Um, and it's up to us to help cross the barriers. We'll talk about some of those barriers later on uh, to help patients get these meds and stay on these meds and really and really thrive and do well. Also, it just I can't help myself, but just to stress that the importance of starting these as early as possible. Um, I like to talk about this, especially in the context of inpatient admission. And the men of you will be on service or attend on service or work on service or work in the hospital, that getting these medications on board quickly can help drastically reduce um, events quickly, that we don't need to wait a long time. I love thinking about defibrillator. We need a one-year prognosis uh, to see the curve split. These, split, these um, benefits play within 30 days of initiation. Beta blocker, 25% relative reduction in risk of death. Arnie can reduce your risk of cardiovascular death or hospitalization by 42% MRA, again, almost 40%, and SGLT2, almost 60% reduction in death, heart failure hospitalization, or um, worsening heart failure. So robust benefits and robust benefits quickly. Mildly reduced. So again, mildly reduced DF has been tough to study for a long time, mainly because we haven't studied it a whole lot. You know, most of the old heart hef ref clinical trials were have heart failure EF less than 40 most of the HEF-PEF trials over the years have been 45 or 50% cut off. There have been a lot more pushes recently to either include these in clinical trials. For example, empagliflozin's preserved, uh, emperor preserved trial and depagliflozin's um, preserved EF trial deliver, which just got resulted um, recently, that they included 40% and higher. Other analyses, for example, Paragon, the HEF-PEF um, RNA trial and Paradigm, the HEF-REF trial, they've done pooled analyses, looking together to try to extrapolate what we can do for patients. Um, and these are the updates to the guidelines that the only class one recommendation is diuretic as needed, but then there is SGLT2 with a two-way recommendation for mildly reduced. And uh, ACE, ARB, ARNI, MRA, evidence-based beta blocker received 2B really because there just haven't been tons of clinical trial data in this EF range. The recommendation from the American College of Cardiac and American Heart Association is that these folks will benefit, especially in the lower end of that range. So if the low 40s, more likely to have benefit than the high 40s. And that's based a lot of that is on the data that's available. Um, I feel strongly enough, and as I mentioned earlier, that my practice and our practice now that we've uh, structuralized and institutionalized at SF General and the inpatient service and coming soon to the outpatient clinic, is that if you have an EF below 50%, you get quad therapy. SGLT2, ASARB, RNA, MRA, and an evidence-based beta blocker. 
And the specific no, uh, uh, verbiage for, for this, for SGLT2, beneficial for decreasing heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality, that's based on the Emperor Preserve trial. And I'll show you a slide on that in a little bit in the HEF-PEF section. That among patients with current or previous symptomatic uh, heart failure with myeloid reduced EF, you have evidence-based beta blocker, ARNI, ACER, ARB, MRA may be considered to reduce the risk. And again, particularly among patients with EF on the lower end of the spectrum, simply because there's just more robust data for these medications in this range. To make it easier for us, uh, the FDA has approved, oh, got almost two years ago now, February of 2021, they updated the uh, uh, approval for Sucubitril Valsartan from below 40% up to quote unquote below normal. They did not intentionally, I spoke with Novartis, did not intentionally give an EF cutoff for this because they wanted to try to make it easier to give more of the medication, but make it quote unquote easier for the providers to say, well, my lab has a 50% cutoff or my lab has a 55% cutoff. Um, but the point being that EF below normal, the FDA has approved it, the guidelines support it. I have had zero prior authorizations rejected for um, an ejection fraction in the 40s. Um, every single person I've tried to put on this medication, the prior author has gone through. I have had much less success in the low 50% range However, below 40, uh, excuse me, below 50, clearly below normal, and the FDA has approved it. And finally, HEF-PEF. HEF-PEF is still tough. These are all the class one recommended medications for HEF-PEF. There's still nothing, unfortunately. The goal of HEF-PEF is to treat the comorbidities. Um, it's true before and it's true now that thinking about AFib, obesity, sleep apnea, et cetera, hypertension, we have to be as aggressive as possible with the comorbidities. The biggest change is the SGLT2, and now it's a two-way recommendation. And it's based on the Emperor Preserve trial. Uh, this was just published a year and a half ago, oh, actually exactly a year ago, uh, Depagliflozin's uh, similar trial, um, Deliver was published at European Society of Cardiology a month and a half ago. Emperor Preserved primary outcome of composite cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure that did reach its primary endpoint. And it was one of the major landmark trials for heart failure preserved ejection fraction. It was, again, a composite endpoint, excuse me, and the effect was really driven by reduction in hospitalization for heart failure rather than cardiovascular death. Uh, it would have been lovely, it would have been great to see something with a mortality benefit. We still have nothing for mortality benefit for HEFPEF aside from treating the comorbidities. Um, but for the HEFPEF uh, world, this was very exciting to have a, a medication that had across the board had benefits. Um, I also want to point out, this is true, and we'll still go back to this as well, that the effects are consistent for patients with or without diabetes. You do not need to have diabetes to receive SGLT2 for heart failure. Again, you do not, even though it was developed as a diabetes medicine, um, as, a, as a joke with patients, as it grew up, it grew up into a heart medicine actually, and a kidney medicine too. But it does not, you do not need to have a diabetic uh, diagnosis um, to use this medication. And again, the FDA um, just a few months ago did approve empagliflozin for heart failure with any ejection fraction. Um, this was again before dapagliflozin had its equivalent clinical trial. I suspect it will get the same approval um, in the coming months. But SGLT2 is now formally approved for heart failure with any ejection fraction. So we should not have any barriers um, besides the normal rigmarole with insurance companies' prior authorization to get this medication. So thinking about them on, on one page, diuretics as needed, as shown too with our two-way recommendation. Arnie is still, it's still tough. Again, the, we can talk about the Paragon HF uh, uh, trial if you would like, which obviously did not reach statistical significance. That had a p-value of 0.059, which sparked this huge, huge debate of what is 0.05 versus 0.06, um, but it did not meet a statistical primary endpoint. And the FDA did not approve it um, for higher ejection fractions. Um, we can also talk a little bit, if you'd like, happy to answer questions about kind of the, the gender issues that were uh, in the sub-analyses of that. Um, but right now it has a 2B recommendation, but it's going to be tough to get. Um, MRA uh, has a 2B recommendation because of TopCat. Again, a trial with a big asterisk because 49% of the patients did not have heart failure and did not receive spironolactone. Um, but my, my practice is to put everyone with HEF-PEF, obviously on an SGLD2, but then as much as possible on an MRA and an ARB. And the formal guidelines for that, for SGLD2, again, for decreasing hospitalizations uh, for heart failure and cardiovascular mortality. MRAs, particularly among patients with EF on the lower end of the spectrum, and same thing for ARNI, which as we talked about, just in terms of the clinical data that are available. <clears throat> 
Now, finally, heart failure with approved ejection fraction. That, again, this is people whose EZF has come up, whether with medical therapy or what have you, from below 40%, a 10% increase up to now in the 40s or 50s or higher. And that these folks, again, it's improved. It is not recovered. It is not cured. I stress to patients, this is not like having an infection where you take antibiotics for a couple of days, then you're done. This is something that we're going to unfortunately have to deal with for the rest of your life. So as we talked about and showed you the data for, hopefully the rest of your life is a lot longer with these medications than without them. And want to stress that the GDMT should be continued. Even if patients are asymptomatic, even if their EF has been now above normal for four echoes in six years, that uh, there's TRED HF uh, randomized trial, small but still randomized trial, and many cohort publications that have all supported this recommendation. And unfortunately, just too, far too often, the, the heart failure will come back if we stop the meds. And again, it gets back to us educating the patient both at the, the time of diagnosis and hopefully when they're getting better. Yes, I'm, it's awesome that you're feeling better, but we do have to continue these medications to keep your heart feeling well. The way I explain it to patients is like we're putting a cocoon around the heart to protect it from all the adverse signaling. I want to touch on base for just a few minutes. Um, there are some other recommendations. Yeah, again, as, as GDMT focused as I am, the two other big themes that, that came out were kind of more formal codification of approaching amyloid heart disease, specifically TTR amyloid um, in patients with heart failure, particularly heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And so I'll talk about this briefly. And we'll also talk about um, uh, the other recommendations, uh, themes in terms of disparities in special populations. And then we'll, again, we'll finish up with some last 10, 15 minutes or so, just really want some nuts and bolts to help um, apply these guidelines to our everyday practice. There's a lot going on in this slide in terms of the diagnostic and treatment of transurbated cardiac amyloidosis amyloid. Um, I don't know if uh, Mandar's on listening in, who's obviously one of our experts. But what I want to really focus on are the three class one recommended, the three green boxes um, of this algorithm. And I know there are four with tefamidus, but I want to think, just draw your attention, please, to the upper right hand corner, thinking about how we initially approach this. And you can see there's a lot more that can go into it. But if you have a patient with a clinical suspicion, for example, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, increased wall thickness, and excuse me, red flag features of cardiac amyloid such as a dis discrepancy between uh, the wall thickness and the voltage on the EKG, uh, bilateral carpal tunnel, other, um, uh, other issues that to, if you're thinking about it, you have to rule out AL amyloid first. This is you know, the first green box here, checking for monoclonal light change, your SPEP, UPEP, immunofixation, serum-free light change. And if you once you exclude that, doing your pyrophosphate scan, your nuclear bone scintigraphy scan um, on the right here, and if that's positive, that's suggestive of amyloid, that, that you're done. That you do not need to biopsy them. You do not need, if you haven't gotten one of cardiac MR, if you have the appropriate pretest probability, rule them out for AL amyloid. And the PYP scan is suggestive, you made your diagnosis. And again, the sequencing is helpful. However, we're still going to be thinking about the same treatment with tefamidus. Um, and... Uh, you don't need these other steps. And so I really just want to focus that this got codified into the guidelines, these three key things, thinking about checking for light change, ruling out AL, getting the PYP scan, and then the sequencing afterwards. And the class one recommendation um, in patients with wild type or variant, again, so we're doing the genetic testing, but you're still going to be using tefamidus um, to reduce the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Uh, and there's a two-way recommendation, cardiac amyloidosis and atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation is reasonable to reduce the risk of stroke regardless of CHADS FAST score. Um, so those things were incorporated into the guidelines um, formally this time. There's a very lengthy, detailed section, and obviously, especially with tefamidus and other medications coming down the pipeline uh, in clinical trial and in clinical practice, that there's more and more impetus for us to be thinking about amyloid. That, you know, obviously for a long time that we would think about it sometimes, but there wasn't much we could do once we diagnosed it. But now there's more and more that we can do to meaningfully impact the patient's quality of life and length of life and natural history of the disease. So thinking about amyloid, just having it um, more in the front of our brain as we see patients, especially with heart failure, preserved ejection fraction, and thinking, well, could this patient have amyloid and being proactive and thinking about it and testing for it.
The next big thing that was a really fundamental change in this set of the guidelines that I, I, I can't stress enough the importance of is the impact of disparities in vulnerable populations. And as I mentioned in the 2013 original heart failure guideline, the word disparities occurred just twice. Um, and there's obviously been a lot more um, both in the uh, lay press and also in the heart failure literature and in between an increased awareness of the other factors that go into our patients and their lived experiences and a profoundly impact their outcomes, their health literacy, et cetera. And the, we as providers, we have to be aware of the other biological factors, social determinants of health and implicit biases that impact the burden of disease, clinical decision-making and effective delivery that I, I sometimes tell patients or even tell you know, how, how staff when we're uh, attending on the wards that the prescription is sometimes the easiest part. It's easy to write a prescription for Kubitschel Valsartan and, and see them later, but we have to think about and make a more of a market impact and thinking about, you know, what's, is the patient going to get it and are they going to take it? And have we really thought about the barriers that exist to their care engagement? And this is something that we do and think about a lot kind of across UCSF, the VA and San Francisco general, and thinking about these other barriers to care engagement, the medical barriers, cognitive impairment, depression, and substance disorders, frailty, and the social barriers. And the social barriers are many. Um, for example, yesterday I had a patient in clinic who usually an elderly woman who usually comes with her daughter and it turns out she can't read. And so I asked her, well, can you, can you, can you read the instructions back to me? He said, well, I can't read. And, and so we have to think about these things and, and not let our own biases um, get in the way of making sure that we probably impact this. And the social barriers are, are huge. And this is something that we've done a lot of work at at San Francisco General to try to address and to treat and I'm very proud, for example, our Heart Plus Clinic is a joint co-management clinic with myself from heart failure, as well as uh, Soraya Azari and multiple team members from the addiction medicine side to engage in a, co a multidisciplinary co-management model to really try to reach some of these social barriers and break them down to try to engage patients in better care. And we've had tremendous success at taking patients, for example, with substance use disorders and suboptimal housing and really be able to engage them in care in the outpatient setting and far less so in the inpatient in the inpatient or acute care setting. And really as, as us to think a little bit outside the box and not just cardiology clinic or not just primary care, or not just social work, but how do we think about integrating these services together in a multidisciplinary way to address some of these social barriers? Um, and it's very important that we work as a team and, and really do outreach with the other folks that, that are delivering care to this patient, that we don't have to do this by ourselves. Obviously, if they're coming in for a cardiology visit, you know, for 20 minutes, we're not going to be able to go through all of these social barriers, but between a combination of, of you, your primary care, social work, et cetera, just to really make sure that we are, are meeting the patient where they're at and addressing the barriers that can be addressed to try to better engage them in care and hopefully get them a better outcome across the board. And disparities in vulnerable populations. Uh, this this has a whole lengthy section uh, in the guideline statement, which is really fantastic. And, and again, there's, I'm, I'm really happy to see them formally incorporating this into the guidelines. And we spend a lot of time thinking about medical therapy. I'm obviously a huge believer in uh, medical therapy. It really works. But we have to think about the data for this and also think about the implementation for it. Unfortunately, most heart failure clinical trials, if you go and look at table one, it's a lot of 70-year-old white men and thinking about how do we represent other patient populations, not just uh, women, but women and these other groups into the clinical trial so that we can better externally generalize them to our, our patients across the board. Thinking about uh, Black African-American populations as an example, you know, I have a much higher incidence of new heart failure diagnosis than a white equivalent uh, patient. Also African self-described Black African-American patients have higher rates of cardiovascular mortality from heart failure and hospitalization for mortality. Uh, hospitalization for heart failure um, compared to uh, white controls. And unfortunately, that's only increasing, particularly uh, in younger populations. And so thinking about these other issues and these other populations and making sure we have thoughtfulness in terms of including them in our clinical research and our clinical trials to make sure that we can better assign you know, um, causality and think about ways that we can better treat each uh, different patient uh, and also thinking about how these other experiences and and, uh, and systemic issues may be impacting the care, health literacy, and approach to care. So I want to fi finish up um, in our last uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, thinking about some practical considerations to implement the GDMT. 
I think this is really, really important, especially given it is polypharmacy, given there are issues with renal function, blood pressure, heart rate, et cetera. Um, and it can be a lot for providers at any one visit. It can be a lot for patients. But I think if we're more comfortable with it, we're going to be able to take a better job and implement them better. So I just have a couple slides for each of the various um, uh, four GDMT pillars. Excuse me. So again, beta blockers, carbidolol or metoprolol succinate. Um, bisoprolol is also okay, though it, most of the time, if you're not going to tolerate metoprolol succinate or carbidolol, you're probably not going to tolerate bisoprolol, but there's still obviously guideline data um, uh, to support it. Better tolerate if you're starting or increasing when or at euvolemia. And you can assess for uptitration every two weeks in clinic. And this is, again, we're partnering with with the nurse, partnering with the other uh, providers in clinic, partnering with primary care to get this done. And I showed you earlier that the sooner we get patients on these medic this medication and others, the sooner they can start deriving benefits. Again, carvedilol all benefit mortality in less than four weeks in the old Copernicus data. So we want to get these patients on these medications and titrated. And of all the quad therapy, as you know, the beta blockers have the tightest correlation between dose and benefit. Some is better than none, more is better than less, and especially, especially true for the beta blockers. So on average, if we can get the person to a higher dose of succinate or higher dose of carbidolol, in general, we can give them a better outcome. There's no role for metoprolol tartrate BID. That's one of my soapbox issues. I'm happy to talk about that more. It really should be dosed four times a day unless you're getting up to metoprolol tartrate 75 or 100 milligrams, but the lower doses just don't last 12 hours. Um, so the best role for tartrates in the hospital for rate control is particularly for AFib. Um, but if you're going to use metoprolol, please use metoprolol succinate. Transitioning to scubitril valsartan. So the 36-hour washout for ACE, but not for ARB. In hospital, it's super easy. Every medicine is time-stamped. We know when exactly 36 hours is. In clinic, what I do, um, just to be as safe as possible, is I say just your last dose of lisinopril is today, skip tomorrow, start Entresto the next morning. Yes, that's closer to 48 hours, but it really ensures that 36 hour washout to give that time between the last ACE dose. You still have to do the 36 hour washout even for Captopril. Um, so in the hospital, using uh, hydrolysis and isosorbide, using Losartan or Valsartan, just so you can transition right over. Um, thinking about the dose, if you're on a low effect, low equivalent dose of lisinopril or Losartan, it starts at the low dose, the 2426 of Sucubitril Valsartan. Uh, you can also start at the 4951, the middle dose, but you're not going to ever start at the high dose 97103. In terms of the dosing, outpatient every two to four weeks. Uh, inpatient, you do are based on Pioneer HF, the inpatient HFREF clinical trial, that you can't make one dose increase at 48 hours and then have them do the other dose increase or increases uh, at, uh, as an outpatient. And please, this is something that I, I, I hope and I presume is familiar to you, but I, I want to say it just to make sure for, for everyone out there that sucubitril has no not natriuretic effects. If you follow the, the natriuretic um, peptide pathway, cyclic GMP, it's, it's agonized by inhibiting um, neprilysin, is sucubitril will necessarily cause diuresis, natriuresis, vasodilation, and less fibrosis. And for some patients, this natriuretic effect is extremely potent. And for some patients, it's not. Um, and so if a patient develops hypotension, orthostatic hypotension, a new acute kidney injury, really thinking about the volume status first before we reflexively say, oh, the creatinine bumped a little bit or the little orthostatic back off on the sucubitral valsartan, please step one, decrease the loop diuretic. Step two, stop the loop diuretic. Step three, increase fluid intake. And if they're still symptomatic, I push number three even more. It's the only time, it's blasphemous for me to say as a heart failure cardiologist, but it's okay to drink more fluid because for some people, the natriuretic effects are very significant. And taking away a loop diuretic is not going to impact their mortality. Taking away sucubitral valsartan will impact their mortality, will increase their morbidity and risk down the line. So we want to make every effort to keep people on this medication and there will be some people who can't tolerate it, but especially on our outpatients, the, almost every single time I've had quote unquote intolerance to sucubitral valsartan, if I just do steps one through three, patients are able to take it. SGLT2, DAPA or EMPA, um, both 10 milligrams, both once a day. Again, similar outcomes regardless of diabetes status. You do not need to be a type two diabetic to get DAPA or EMPA for heart failure of any, any ejection fraction. We're not going to use it, though, in type 1 diabetics uh, due to the increased risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. 
And we can use this in people whose kidney function is pretty poor, all the way down to a GFR of 20. So yes, patients with a GFR in the 20s and 30s are included in the clinical trials and it is safe to start. I'll show you that there is a dip in the GFR to be expected, um, and I'll show you the timing of that on the next slide. The most common adverse events are related to volume depletion and kidney impairment, particularly for patients that do have diabetes, especially significant hyperglycemia. Remember, this is blocking a sodium glucose transporter in the kidney that makes you pee out more sugar. And the higher your blood sugar level is, the more glucose urea you're going to have. And this is, again, why they thought this was going to be a great diabetes medicine, because high blood sugar, lots of urine output. Um, lots of glucose output, low blood sugar, you shouldn't lose that much blood sugar and have hypoglycemia. And they're correct, um, but most of the, the volume issues, the diarrhea issues are related to hyperglycemia. The thing that I do want to point out though, that is not trivial, anywhere from five to 7% of, of patients, a little bit higher for women and uncircumcised men is the genital mycotic infection. This is treatable with fluconazole 150 milligrams PO times one. And interestingly, 80 plus percent of patients who get one episode will not have another episode. I also must point out, please, that it's a bacterial infection. So your E. coli, bacterial UTI, no difference in any of the diabetic or non-diabetic populations in those in terms of risk of a bacterial UTI. It's the mycotic infections that are, are at a higher risk, especially in the diabetic patients. And SGLT2 works fast. I just want to stress how fast these work to reduce their primary outcome in the dapagliflozin, uh, DAPA-HF, and empagliflozin, emperor-reduced. Right about one month, 30 days, plus or minus, people are dying less and staying out of the hospital more. So very rapid benefits. And I don't have, for the sake of time, the data showing that they are safe to do. Um, impulse uh, and uh, the sotagliflozin clinical trials show that it is safe in the inpatient setting to start these medications. We should please start them before they go home and to please start them in clinic. Blood pressure, negligible effects. So this is just showing briefly from DAPA-HF, diabetic, non-diabetic patients that the blood pressure adjusted mean on the left for diabetic, on the right for non-diabetic, that there's really no difference in blood pressure in these patients. And I mentioned that I was going to say that this is from Emperor Reduced, that the GFR, the red dashed line for empagliflozin, you see at about four weeks max, the GFR will dip, but then improve. This is very similar to starting another RAS inhibitor, uh, ACE inhibitor, ARB, et cetera. But then the rate of renal disease progression is blunted over time compared to placebo. And again, not getting into the um, other recommendations and FDA approvals and guideline statements for uh, SGLT2 for kidney disease, um, but know that the GFR can dip a little bit, it has to do with GFR uh, glomerular feedback, um, and the patients can do well and should be continued on these medications. And don't forget spironolactone. This is the one that's always forgotten in all the registries, inpatient, outpatient. This is the one that gets forgotten the most, but huge relative risk reduction in the 11% absolute risk reduction in death. You don't need to be on target GDMT. You can start at 12 and a half or 25 milligrams daily. In the RAILS landmark clinical trial from uh, New England Journal from 1999, that the median dose, the mean dose in the trial was 26 milligrams. So people got benefit on 25 milligrams. Um, it will not impact blood pressure. I took out a slide, but I'm happy to talk about, they looked at a plerinone emphasis and a spironolactone rails that put the patients together um, and irrespective of where your baseline blood pressure was, whether it was low or high to start, that there's no change in blood pressure um, between the groups. The big thing you have to have to have to follow though is the potassium level. And again, so if you're in the hospital checking labs once or twice a day, it's a great time to start. But in clinic, trying to get them to come back three days to a week, getting them all these labs is, is not going to be uh, realistic but you have to follow the potassium. And I, I wanna please point out that having a low potassium in the low fives is not life-threatening. Five, two, five, three is okay. You have to think about reversible things. Are they over diuresis, their diet, other medications? And it comes up very often that someone's been on spironolactone for uh, months or years, and they've never had hyperkalemia. Now all of a sudden their K is elevated to really think about what else is going on. Again, other medications, over diuresis, their heart failure is better. They don't need the loop diuretic. Uh, but please, before we stop a medication with a huge reduction in dying for a K of 5.2, please, please think about reversible things. Please think about repeating the lab. We want to try to keep these medicines safe, but keep them on as much as we can. And finally, then I'll have about 10 minutes to take some questions, is putting it all together. We talked about the guidelines, and the guidelines are only as good as we put them into clinical practice. 
that we have lots of class one recommended interventions um, to make people live longer, feel better, stay out of the hospital more, but we have to use them. We have to think about the polypharmacy. We have to think about the other barriers, whether they're socially determinant or a vulnerable population and what's in the way of, of the patient getting the care that they need to live as long as possible and with a good a quality of life as possible. That again, thinking about to the relative risk of this patient population that stable heart failure is not low risk. Stable heart failure is not low risk. That the potential risks of escalating, sure, there's side effects, polypharmacy, cost, but that's our job. Our job is to navigate these things. Our job is to help say, well, God, your copayment is X. Let's see, let's talk to pharmacy or talk to your insurance. Can we get something to bring the cost down? Can we, you know, actually it's open enrollment season now. Can we do something else um, to get you these medicines at a better cost? Because there are huge ramifications if we don't attempt to change worse survival, more hospitalizations, worse quality of life, uh, that this regimen really works and is supported in the guidelines, supported in the literature, and the onus is on us to make it happen. So with that, uh, I will stop there. It looks like we have um, just under 10 minutes and I I'm happy to take any questions. Um, but again, I just wanna thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak with you all today about the update and the guidelines um, and some incredibly exciting things that we can do for our patients. And we just have to do them together in a, um, in a collaboratory way. So thank you so very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Davis. That was a very practical talk reviewing the updates on management of heart failure in the 2022 guidelines. So if anyone has questions um, in the audience, please type it in the chat or raise your hand. And if you prefer to keep the questions anonymous, you can also direct message me and I can ask the question on your behalf. Um, it looks like Anna Morrison had a question. I'm, I'm wondering, Anna, are you able to unmute to ask the question? And if not, I'm happy to ask it for you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I work in the electrophysiology clinic, but some of our doctors start um, heart failure or GDMT while they're admitted. Um, they're always wanting us to, you know, rapidly start quad therapy all at once. Um, on the clinical side, um, we find it very difficult to do that <laughs> easily, safely, and, you know, able to find the source of maybe what the side effect or, you know, which medication is causing the problem for them. So then it, it causes a lot of, okay, we got to take this one off and restart this and we'll try to bump this down. How do you feel about step therapy versus, you know, the rapid initiation? So great question. This comes up all the time. And I also see Dr. Cheerling put in a comment about strong HF. Um, there'll be a late breaking trial on Monday at HA. Um, they did meet their primary endpoints. So I'm very excited to see that. And there has, there's been a, a lot of talk. Greg Fonero, a chief down at UCLA, uh, talks about this all, all the time. The goal is to get people on these medicines as fast as possible and as safe as possible within whatever barriers they may have. And this is where a couple of things I'll say. One is to partner with other, other providers partner with primary care, partner with the other people in your clinic, partner with, you know, if you're an EP clinic, partnering with, with the general cardiologist or the heart failure cardiology team, that it takes a team to do this. Um, you know, in our clinic, you know, myself and two nurse practitioners and nurse, we finally very excited to have a, a pharmacist joining us, um, but to use everyone on their, on the team. And I'll also say a couple of things very quickly to leave room for other questions. One is if you're using metoprolol succinate, it's really, that's for heart rate. Very low, especially at lower doses, very limited blood pressure effects. The ASARB Arnie, hopefully Arnie, that that's what's going to have blood pressure. Really think about diuretic. The SGLT2 and MRA are not going to impact our patient's uh, blood pressure. Uh, you have to think about the potassium and spironolactone. So if we're thinking about what's going to affect their vital signs, for example, it's really just the beta blocker in the heart rate, especially with succinate, and the Arnie for the blood pressure. So from that perspective, they should play well together. Also, what's been shown is that the heart failure therapy begets more heart failure therapy. That if you follow patients over six, eight, 12 months after drug initiation, if you come back eight months, especially 12 months uh, later for Arnie, they're more likely to still be on the uh, on the MRA. And SGLT2, they're more likely to still be on the MRA. Why? There's actually less discontinuation for hyperkalemia. That these medications actually help reduce hyperkalemia over time, make the renal function better over time. So I, I think that you start as much as, as you can. If patients say, I'm not starting four new meds, I'll do one. But then can they see your nurse in a week? Can they see another provider a week after that? Can you partner with people to try to get the touch points? Great. And we have a lot of other questions that have come in. So we'll just go in the order that they were uh, brought up. So Dr. Agarwal, you had raised your hand. Did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? 
Yes, thank you, um, Lelith. Um, that was a fantastic uh, talk, Jonathan. And uh, my question is going to take you maybe completely in a different direction here. So I apologize for that. Um, you know, I think over the decades, we have seen so many evidence-based heart failure therapies coming up um, and they're all been so, so effective. My question is, uh, it leads to the last slide that you mentioned that um, these therapies are as, as are good as, as long as they get to the patients. So um, do, can you comment a little bit about, um, and this could be a completely grand round in itself, but can you comment on uh, the efforts towards bringing this evidence to practice as to where the barriers are and you know, with this implementation science being a really amazing methodology to get to, you know, design uh, strategies to get the uh, the evidence into patients' hands. I think, is there anything you can comment on and how, what are the barriers and how are they being addressed? Because I think that's where the biggest gap seems to be for these patients uh, in the field. No, it's a great, and it, it's, there's so many barriers that exist. And, do all the providers know they should be prescribing them? Do patients know they have heart failure? Do patients know that the treatments for heart failure include X, Y, and Z, and kind of everywhere in between? Um, we could certainly, I'm happy to talk, but there's there's a lot of barriers to um, to do it. I, I spent a lot of time lecturing to, I work in the San Francisco Health Network, so talking to primary care providers across, um, across the uh, 20 some odd clinics in the city. So I just increasing awareness on the provider level. Um, and again, I mentioned that in partnership, Luke Zier, he talked about this at his grand rounds yesterday. We put in this entirely new care path in Epic at SF General that any patient with heart failure automatically prompts the provider to, hey, your patient has heart failure. Have you thought about these medicines? Have you thought about the social determinants of health? That it looks, it screens the social work notes and says, oh, by the way, their housing isn't great or their food, uh, food insecurity. Have you thought about you know, ordering meals on wheels or reaching out to social work addiction care team? So I, I think it, the the access spans the entire spectrum, and not even getting into insurance and prior offs and costs and things. But be, the first step is us thinking about it and us knowing about it and us trying to start the prescription process and the engagement process uh, and everything in between. But lot there's a lot to unpack with that with that question. Thank you. And then Dr. Tsang, you had raised your hand. Did you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, hi, Jonathan. Um, good talk. And uh, I want to bring up one point and I had a question for you. So um, Satvik um, did, has a paper in press um, and Jackie P. Um, we're looking at burden of sudden death in post-SCD. Um, and guess guess how many, guess what percentage of people were on GDMT that died suddenly? Small. Very 6%, small. 6% of people on heart failure died suddenly. So, to the point being, those are the people we never see. You are seeing the people that make it to our clinics and get prescribed stuff, and the people we're not saving are, are like a minuscule, uh, you know, uh, amount, you know, meeting, meeting, not even close to meeting criteria for GDMT. So that, the, that my question is, I'm thinking specifically about a couple of patients that we shared together where um, ablating their PVCs and the AFib, um, you know. It made a significant impact in improving their EF. Where, where in the timeline do you, um, you know, put in uh, if, if somebody has significant burden of PVCs, twenty percent or AF? What, where, where do you place, uh, you know, priority of of those things? I'm gonna have to be very careful with that answer because you're speaking to an electrophysiologist. Um, my bias is early. Uh, and, and to your point about the medical therapy, I actually published an editorial in this about a year ago or so, that the GDMT significantly reduces risk of sudden cardiac death. Looking at um, Sukubaja Valsartan by itself, that if you take patients that are ICD eligible, within six months, a third are no longer eligible because their EF is too high. And by a year, two thirds are no longer eligible because their EF is too high. Um, so just putting people on GDMT can can obviate a lot of the needs for defibrillators and and, and do it quickly. I promise we're not going to put you out of business because I think that the, if you can have a modifying thing such as you know getting rid of the atrial fibrillation or getting rid of the PVCs, especially if they're driving the heart failure disease, that in my mind, the sooner you get rid of it, the sooner they can start recovering. Um, and I, again, I want to be mindful that I'm speaking to electrophysiologists, not to tell you when to do your procedure. Uh, but, but, but my bias is, is to at least evaluate, at least have them in front of you to talk, have a conversation as early as possible. And if there are other things that need to happen first, so be it. But I think at least an early conversation um, about these other options and things that can be done before or after are incredibly important. 
Dr. Ching, did you want to ask your questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Hey, Jonathan, great talk. I think there's a lot of other questions, so I'll try to keep mine brief. Can you share your approach to patients with hyperkalemia on things like spironolactone and whether or not you use potassium binders? And the second question being what your approach is for GMT for HEFREF and patients on dialysis? So I'll, I'll take the dialysis one, one first. And again, this is tough because they're excluded from all the clinical trials. Um, my bias is if they're stable on dialysis, have a conversation with a nephrologist about an ACE or an ARB and about spironolactone. Um, now, what again, they weren't in any RCT. They're, you know, they obviously would have been excluded. I, I don't know how much benefit if their renal function is, is non-existent to, to put them on these on these medications in, in the ACE ARB uh, MRA pathway. My bias is to try. Again, it's kind of a data free. It is a data free zone, but I do like to to try if it's otherwise otherwise safe. I don't know how much benefit, but I I feel better doing it. But I don't have you know RCT perspective data saying if it's helpful or not. And the spironolactone, there's the renal folks here use a lot of Lucalma. As you know, the data for it in the heart failure population really hasn't been substantiated. Uh, a lot of them have extremely high volumes of uh, quantities of salt in them. Uh, I'm not sure there's a little bit of variability, how much of the salt stays in the intestinal lumen and how much actually gets absorbed into the body in terms of that salt load. It's still an area of active research that you can speak to it as well as, well as I can. And with the, my point is the minor hyperkalemia, like the K and the low fives. Um, that's the time where I really think that, um, and uh, Andy Sauer, um, uh, Harriet Van Spall, and a few others wrote an editorial um, two or three months ago about this, that the K, the high fives, sixes, obviously have to do your normal hyperkalemia workup, but the low fives, five, one, five, three, that this is not a life-threatening emergency and you have to be diligent. You can't forget about it, but really assessing for reversible causes, especially if the patient's been on medical therapy for a while and maybe they just don't need the diuretic anymore because their heart failure is getting better um, and taking that away. Thinking about diet, I, I remember one patient who she lost her, um, she had a, an injury and so she couldn't get down from the third floor of her stairs. And so her boyfriend was bringing her jack in the box and her K all of a sudden went up to six and had never been high before. And so we talked to her and figured out what was going on. And we actually pulled up a menu for Jack in the Box on my phone in clinic and looked for better options until she could kind of get, get stronger from her injury. Um, but I think the binder issue is still, um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I think it's still up for debate given any potential heart failure adverse events from the salt in them. But certainly anything we can do to get them on spironolactone, you think that would be beneficial. Uh, yeah, thank you, John. I, I think I share the same thoughts. I, that's why I asked those two questions. I think that they're still controversial. I'm, I like you are, uh, is equally aggressive with patients on end-stage renal disease. There's some retrospect data, at the very least, that show that medications like spironolactone and uh, um, uh, scupitril valsartan may still help. And at least in some patients, I've seen that those patients benefit. Um, and really, other outside of that, there's not a lot of other options for them. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm still trying to gain experience on when to reach for potassium binders. But agree, you know, I think that um, we need to be really aggressive getting getting patients on spironolactone, regardless. Thank you. Great, these are all um, wonderful questions. I think just to respect everyone's time, we'll go to um, 105. We started five minutes late. Um, so, Dr. Tang, are, are you available to ask your question? Uh, sure, really quickly, uh, Jonathan. Thank you so much for the uh, excellent points that you make. I'm really rooting for your stimulant clinic. I'm looking forward to hear more about it as I uh, refer patients into it. Uh, minor question here about adapto, you know, rotating through a service here. You know, residents always, you know, they remember your points very well. So they always ask, you know, sharing things like, oh, Dr. Davis said this and that. So a uh, good job. Uh, when you say so emphatically, the adapto doesn't change blood pressure. I'm wondering, Maybe for the non heart failure patients, that wouldn't be true. Perhaps the patient that you see, you don't see much change over time. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, I actually have a, a slide here. It's a, it's, a, it's a busy slide that I had taken out of the talk, and I will. Um, so, to, to, to a couple points as I as I pull this up. One, if we think about from a, a general patient perspective, primary care, treat hypertension. How often are we putting spironolactone as a first line, second line, third line, or even fourth line agent for the treatment of hypertension? 
Um, this is the paper to which I was alluding, emphasis for uh, Plerinone rails, uh, spironolactone, about 4,400 patients. And what they did, and again, I, I took this out of the main talk because it, it takes a little bit of time to ex explain, but each pair of colored lines is a baseline blood pressure from these two trials with the lowest baseline blood pressure at the top in light blue to the highest baseline blood pressure at the bottom in yellow. Um, and you can see that these lines track in parallel. So the blue, the hypotense, more hypotensive patients, their, excuse me, their blood pressure got better over the course of time, but got better in parallel. And, and similarly, the patients with higher blood pressure got hot, got their blood pressure improved, but improved in parallel, you know, two or three millimeters of mercury different. Um, so in, in our half ref patients, the, the blood pressure effects are, are very, very small, if at all. And so sometimes, in fact, especially in the hospital, patients' blood pressure is 96, and we're worried about a RAS inhibitor, worried maybe about the beta blocker, but SJ2 and MRA should be fine. Um, and it's, you know, provided they're not super hyperglycemic in terms of the SGLT2, um, but they, they tend to be very well tolerated. And if someone's, in, I think the other point, kind of the flip side, someone comes in hypotensive, that we can't blame the spironolactone. Their blood pressure is usually 120 over 80, and now all of a sudden they're coming with a blood pressure of 82, that it's not the MRA's fault. So we may stop the MRA if the blood pressure is 82, but that that's we shouldn't stop there. Um, and you see that all the time with you know, patients coming in, the blood pressure is 100 instead of 140, and like all of a sudden they're stopping the spironolactone for hypotension. And I, I, I think what I really want to stress both with the blood pressure and with the potassium is, and we're thinking about the volume and blood pressure with Sacubitra Valsartan is before we knee-jerk stop these things, think, well, what else is going on? You know, these meds have such a profound benefits on making people just better that um, if the blood pressure is a little bit lower, think, well, are they over um, Are they on something else? Are they sick? Are they this? Are they that? Um, to be more mindful of these things. But I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, uh, no, that's uh, very helpful. Yeah, I'm only partially guilty. I don't tend to stop. I just kind of decrease the dose meanwhile to let them continue to work. Thank you so much. Thank you. It looks like Matt Dersenfeld, if he's still there, has had his, has his hand up. It's popped up on my screen. So, um, Jonathan, I'm masquerading as Matt today, but just want to say amazing talk. I want to oh. thank you so much for all that you do for our patients and just uh, highlight at um, HA that you, Emily Cederbaum, Matt Dersenfeld, and uh, uh, Diane Gian are all going to be giving uh, talks on social determinants of health and heart failure. Um, but my question was about the advanced therapies. You know, you, you touched upon them briefly. I'm curious about your thoughts about social determinants of health and advanced heart failure therapies. And if, if we're referring enough patients, something you and I have talked about. Yeah, well, they should definitely come through heart failure clinic, which is why we have heart failure clinic and and, and having, being an advanced heart failure trained practicing provider, I, I can help think about these barriers and, and especially think about them earlier um, in their disease course. Um, I have many patients that are objectively from a heart perspective, sick enough for a VAT or a transplant, but their, their housing is this or their social support is that. And by seeing me earlier, I can start working with them um, and getting those things navigated sooner. So by the time they really are sick enough and they needed a VAD yesterday, those other I's have been dotted and T's crossed. Um, that the the volume is 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 perfect. I just got one of Matt's patients of uh, I didn't do it, but got one of Matt Thurstenfeld's patients in, in front of a VAD, but I had to make sure the guy colon cancer was resected and make sure his housing was stable before getting all these things done. But if he hadn't not just toting my own horn, but if he hadn't seen me been in partnership with me and heart failure clinic at the general, that never would have happened and he'd probably be dead. So I, I think that, you know, the thing is, is thinking about these things earlier in the disease course when they're still modifiable before the, the cat's out of the bag with the heart failure. Um, and there's another patient who is uh, hopefully getting admitted this coming uh, uh, this week or next week for to be evaluated for a VAD. But for the last six months, we've been talking about his alcohol use and his tobacco use because he's had a ventricle of eight and a half centimeters for a long time. And he's not going to get better, but I can't refer him if he's still drinking or smoking. So um, these are things that we try to just to work on in heart failure clinic because we know what the natural history is and we have a lot of resources and partnerships to address them. Uh, Dr. Davis, do you have a few minutes for additional questions? Certainly. Okay, Dr. Benowitz, I saw you had written a question in the chat. Are you available to ask the question? Yeah, um, so thanks, Jonathan. Great talk. So my question is about the issue of heart failure with improved ejection fraction. 
So when we know what the heart failure cause is, long-standing hypertension or ischemic heart disease, that's one thing. But what if we have like a postpartum cardiomyopathy or an alcoholic who stops drinking or someone with a viral myocarditis? Um, so do we need to think about the cause as opposed to just continuing therapy long-term? I would I would advocate, so the short answer is yes, they should continue. The Trying to be a little bit more granular about that is what was the predisposition? So did they have, was it just the alcohol? Was it just the virus? Or there's some other genetic predisposition or familial distribution, or, or is it a multi-hit thing from something else? Maybe they had some other hypertension or maybe they had a genetic risk factor and you know they had, had myocarditis once from whether it was from alcohol or from something else. And just because they've stopped drinking, that there still was an underlying injury, an underlying change to the neurobiology. And I would very, very much advocate for staying on medications. And I think the data that we have from cohorts from TreadHF all support that. You know, it comes up all the time. I think one thing was, you know, if they're in the hospital, they come in critically ill for whatever reason, the echo shows a reduced EF. And then I'm not talking about Takatsubo, but you know, they come in, they're on pressors and they're sick and they're septic, and then their EF is low. And then a week later, the, all the evil humors have been resolved. They've, you know, the infection's gone. Their EF is now back to 55, 60%. I think that's someone who's different. They're purely acutely critically ill. Um, but if someone has myocarditis, alcohol use leading to it, stimulant use, et cetera, um, I, you should, I, my, my interpretation of the guidelines and the literature is that you should stay on the medications because you just don't know what are the, 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 the neuropathology um, and the adverse signaling, if that's going to stay and you, and you can't risk it. Cause every time the EF comes up and then goes back down, the harder it is to get it back up. Um, and it's just, I think that the, the totality of the data say, again, we don't have a crystal ball for each individual patient, um, but I would stay on the medications. And I think the guidelines of the data support that. Great. And Dr. Song, you had a question as well. Hey, yeah, thanks. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I have a question. I, when I was in a general, I had a lot of consults for uh, incidental finding of reduced EF, especially in patients with substance use, and they had no symptoms of heart failure. So they're technically stage B. So just curious to hear what's your approach for patients with stage B uh, have have breath and uh, is there any benefit of starting clot therapy for this uh, subset of patients? You know, I, I would. It, again, it is a little bit of a gray area because these patients aren't, as you say, and as we talked about, specifically enrolled in clinical trials. If you're asymptomatic, I'm not going to identify you for a heart failure trial because um, I'm not going to know that you have heart failure if, unless there's some other way that you happen to get your echo. Like I said, if you get it for some other reason or uh, I see maybe once every uh, six to eight weeks, I see someone um, who had a stroke and they have an echo done. And it turns out their EF is 22% and it was probably an LV thrombus that flipped off and the, no one had any idea that they had, including the patient, they had heart failure. I think the natural history, if someone has an EF of 20% and you're not, and they, even if they're asymptomatic, that the natural history is such that it, it's going to lead to problems. And this, what we know from all the GDMT data is that the sooner you put people on it, the more likely they are to get better. So if someone's had a low EF for seven years and now their walls are dilated and now they're starting medical therapy versus someone who just, we just picked up on this last week, you know, the chance of improving their likelihood or livelihood, excuse me, and survival, I think goes up. So my bias, yes, is to treat them um, like stage C, knowing that it is a little bit of a gray area in the data. Um, but if you're going to use what we know about the natural history to, to treat. Thank you. And then last question from Dr. Stock, wondering if you would like to unmute yourself to ask. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Leila and everyone who stayed and thank you, Jonathan, for staying late for us. Uh, so I have a question about <clears throat> practices and practical things that you might have recommendations for general cardiologists and primary care physicians. So especially in vulnerable populations or people who are not coming into clinic that frequently, when we do get them for that once a year, maybe visit, would you consider or recommend um, in vulnerable patients and high risk that we are more 
um, proactive in screening. Let's say, could we get, for example, a BNP in these patients or a microalbuminuria, and that way flag these patients and come to attention that the risk factors need to be um, improved, they might have uncontrolled hypertension. Um, what are your thoughts about early screening in this sense? Yeah, I, I think that's great. I think it also just to take a half a step back is just thinking about the hypertensive patient before you check those other things, knowing that hypertension is the, one of the biggest modifiable risk factors for development of heart failure later in life, that how, how do we just make everyone's blood pressure better? Um, but I, 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 to your, to your excellent point that not everyone has the same risk. If I give everyone a blood pressure of 160, not everyone is going to develop heart failure in their lifetime. Um, even though they're more likely than someone with a lower blood pressure, uh, you know, I, off the top of my head, I, I know, I know there are, there are data looking at checking BNP early and screening. And unfortunately I'm blanking off the top of my head, the names of those, of those references. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable, um, I don't think it's unreasonable, but um, I don't have the data to support it, but it makes sense. It certainly makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in, in my, as a preventive cardiologist, I, I mostly um, work in people who are worried about their atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. So we, um, I screen routinely for um, microalbuminuria because it's an early marker of endothelial dysfunction. But I also see patients that have symptoms of um, dyspnea or things that are unclear or family history of heart failure. And I screen them with BMPs and I found a few. Um, the data on uh, cost effectiveness seems to, from the early 2000s, right? Seems to indicate some, some um, effectiveness, but I was, Maybe it's something to consider later, um, but thank you. Thank you for your insights. Oh, that's a, that's a, very that's really valuable uh, points. I really appreciate your talk. Taught and me the, a lot the more, today. The, yeah. the more successful you are, the less I have to do what I do, which is just fine. That, you know, if we can, the more we can prevent, um, I kind of joke if, you know, the goal is to obviate the need for VAD and transplant as much as possible because medical therapy can be good, but you know, the earlier you can intervene, the earlier you can make a difference, um, and the less aggressive you have to be down the line, the better. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan, and and uh, thank you for for this amazing talk. I'm going to um, rerun it so I I uh, I learn even more. So. Right, and, and again, yeah. for you and, and for anyone else, that you have my email address. That I I'm always happy to talk um, about any of these things. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, you, Thank well. you Layla, and everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Davis, for a fantastic talk. And again, for taking all those questions, I think that just points to how pervasive heart failure is and how important it is for us to try to optimally manage. So we'll have a recording of this available on our division's YouTube page. And next week we have um, for folks in the audience, Dr. Noel Barry Mertz from uh, Cedar sinai She'll be giving the Sokola lecture on ischemic heart disease in women. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Dr.